resurrection power living on the inside of you if you're a Christian. Amen.
just give you all the glory, honor, and praise you so deserve tonight. We know many people's got many things going on in their lives today. Many people have many things they may be able to think about now, many obligations tomorrow. But Father, we just cast our care upon you right now, for you care for us and love us. Tonight we come to you humbly, reverently, and boldly. Father, to the throne of grace to obtain all the grace, mercy, and help that we need. In time of need, Father, we thank you, Father. We come expecting a message fresh off the press from heaven tonight, Father. What thus saith the Spirit of God in and through the Word of God to this group of people tonight, Father. We're not focused on obligations or things going on. Even things have been done to us. We're focused on looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The reality of it is, is if we have Jesus, we have all we need. We thank you, Father, tonight, Father, for every person I thank you that's in this place. I know I could open my eyes. Maybe I know all of them. Maybe not a few. But regardless, you know the state of every heart in life. You know what they're facing today. You know what's to come tomorrow. You know, Father, without a question, the word that they need for tonight. Father, you know the anointing that needs to accompany the word. And, Father, I thank you now that as I yield myself to be the vessel that you've called me to be, a vessel meet ready and prepared for the master's use. As I open my mouth to speak this message, I thank you, Father, to be as the oracles of God, divine inspiration divine answers to questions and concerns they may have in their life. And we just thank you, Father, they're going to receive this word with meekness. They're going to apply it. It's going to change, challenge, and alter the course of their lives forever. And I thank you for the help and aid of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> because I realize by the Spirit of God that some of them are in sensitive situations, we could say. They have been hurt. They have been damaged. They have been in, in, in facing oppression and depression and many such things the enemies endeavored, tried and strived to work in their life. And we just thank you tonight that opening their hearts and minds to receive what you're saying by the Spirit of God. This message has been strongly impressed for some time upon me, Father, and upon my heart for this group of people, and it's of course for me too, but for this group of people. And we thank you, Father, they're going to receive it, they're going to apply it, and they're going to walk out of what they've been in what they've been through, and they're going to walk out into freedom and victory as they put their faith and trust in you. So we just thank you. At the last day, man, as we say regularly, these lives will be changed forever. But Father, above everything that's said and done, you'll get the glory. You'll get the honor and praise you so deserve. We count these things done by faith right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. Thank God for the word. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Aren't you glad to be in church? Yes, aren't you glad to be the church? Yes. Amen. You turn in your Bible to Matthew 24. I never do what I'm going to do tonight. I think I mentioned it Sunday morning. I don't know. <coughs> We're going to pick up this evening where we left off Sunday at the Lord's instruction. And I know what he said when he told me before Sunday, like not, not yesterday, but last Tuesday, we begin dealing with about this message. The title of it being, it's be the same one up on the screen. Offense, don't take the bait. Offense, don't take the bait. And, I, and as most people here know, I have a different message every Wednesday uh, compared to this Sunday message. It's, it's, it's kind of different, I guess you could say, but there seems to be a different anointing on Wednesday nights than on Sunday morning. Same Holy Ghost. <clears throat> but, but it's just different. But he said, I want you to minister this message because it's where people are. And I told him this evening. On the way to church as I was praying, I said, Lord, I have no problem doing that because I do what you tell me to do. I said, but you do realize Sunday morning I'm not ministering this Pastor Appreciation Day. So you told me just to stay on this till we get off. I'm not ministering Sunday morning. I said, Lord, next week. I said, next Wednesday night I believe is a healing service. And I said, so we'll be ministering along those lines. And he said this to me. He said, son, do you know how many of your very own people have not been able to receive their healing? And are not walking in the blessings. And have lost both their peace and joy. Because they're offended. He said don't think that message has nothing to do with next week. Because it does. He said many are not walking in my best. And they're living below their privileges. Because of the very message we're talking about right now. <clears throat> it's not God's will that you and I are offended. And as we're going to look in Luke 17. Different ones in a minute. It's coming to everybody. Anybody says they've never been tempted to be offended is actually contradicting the word. That's not true. I told you Matthew 24 should go there if you hadn't already. <clears throat> but I, I started this past Sunday, and, and I give you an example 
of my own example, and this is something I really have to pray about with this message because I've got so many examples that I can't really keep up with them. So I have to get the Holy Spirit to lead me in which ones to use. But I use this example Sunday morning. Lardy and I started in, well, we, we got married in 95, and, and then make a long story short, really rededicated our heart and lives to the Lord when Jay was born and got sick and almost died. We got serious <clears throat> with God. He said, if you'll draw him out of him, he'll draw him out of you. I have a minister, the friend that says, if you if you get serious with God, he'll get serious with you. He's always ready. He's just waiting on you to be ready. Amen. So me and Lardy got serious with God. And for sure, when things get dire, you need God all the time. But when you get in trouble and he's your only answer, you might want to get serious with him. So let me make a long story short. We got serious. We got rededicated our lives to the Lord. And then over a period of time, we had started going back and forth down to Bono there. Daddy was the pastor. He started the church in 85, but it had grown to a certain measure, certain degree. It was doing real good and was in the older building, what they called the crack house. It used to be a club or a bar. But we turned it into a church. We moved in there back in 1985 and had grown to a certain measure until the point they were building another church <clears throat> to seated several hundred people. And, and so we could move into it. But in the process of time, from me and Arlie was in the process of moving there to serve as his associate pastors. And we got there and we moved in 2000. November is when I started working. Of 2000 there at the church, me and Arlie packed up and moved. And I told this in part Sunday, and, and Lardy's not, she doesn't try, Miss Lardy doesn't try to correct my message or anything, but we were talking about this this past week, and, and she said, I just, well, I, hope, I hope people don't think that you were saying anything, you know, negative about your dad, and I wasn't, and I'm going to clarify what I was saying. I wasn't saying anything negative about dad who was the pastor, that was not my goal, but I will make this statement as I share this story, you have to be deliberate in your decision to walk in the love of God and not be offended, or you will be offended. You'll be out of love, out from under the covenant of love, and you'll walk into danger and destruction that's not the will of God for your life. That was my point. My dad was one of the greatest examples, a man of God and a man of character in my life, and I'm grateful for him to this day. I was not in any way, shape, form, or truck fashion trying to make him look any sort of way because I don't believe that he had ever dealt with it like, like it happened at this time. But we had a fellow in the church, I told you, that had a different position. The church was thriving and growing. He was over another part of the church under daddy's authority, but he got a hold of this fake message that's out here. I call it the... I uh, think Brother Andy called it the greasy grace message. I just call it the grace message. We believe in the grace of God, but they got this message now they preach it, that the grace of God just means everything is finished and you don't have to do nothing. If I come in here like I'm doing tonight and minister that you got some right responsibilities, I'm damaging and destroying your life because I'm putting you back under the works of the law. Because anything that's your responsibility, that's law and not grace and that's ignorant because it's not biblical. I'm not working to be saved, but I have a responsibility and a ministry of reconciliation to fulfill and a job to do because I am saved. I'm not trying to get saved through my good works. That'd be the law, right? But this individual got a hold of this false message in the church. And over a period of time, it got worse and worse and worse. And, 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 and Daddy's ministering in the big church, and he's ministering in the area he was in. Matter of fact, he's over the youth, and he's ministering it, but then he started infiltrating the parents, and he started getting his own little group, and the messages opposed each other. And then, and then the further it went, the worse it got. To a period, of, over a period of time, this individual quit the church. And you would say, well, that was a good thing. Well, it was a good thing. could have been a good thing. But when he quit the church, he didn't just leave and quit the church and never talk about it anymore. There was all kind of things said repeatedly. This was not recently. This was 20-some-odd years ago, so I'm not talking about anything that just happened. But, but he left and had his own disciples, so to speak, and instead he was attacking the church and doubting and what he was and what he wasn't and all this kind of stuff. Well, meanwhile, in the church, what happened? This is what happened. This is what happened in your life. You're not careful. I'll tell you something else. This wisdom of God. Be careful with people that make you choose sides. Be real careful because they're already offended. If you don't agree with them, Be careful with that. That should be an alarm bell immediately. You don't agree with me. I preach the gospel. It's the truth tonight. And I love you with all of my heart. But you can do whatever you're doing. That's my responsibility to deliver to you. I'm not going to get mad and cry. And I don't like it if you disobey the word and go your own way. I don't like that at all. But I don't take it personally and say, well, you just don't agree with me. You don't believe in me. No, it's not about me. 
back to the story. This individual was over here doing all these things and all this message and all this stuff and attacking daddy and he's a, you know, he's a fraud and he's preaching the wrong message and all this kind of stuff. And this was the guy that he had helped tremendously. The church had took up, sent him off to Bible school and stuff and paid for it. I mean, help. This isn't just Joe Blow off the street. This is somebody that come from nothing that he helped that turned on. But then in the church, you had the other group in the church that believed in daddy as the pastor and had their faith in him, which is great, fine, and dandy. <clears throat> but what, what happened there was you ended up with two sides. Because in the church at that time, you had this individual out here with his disciples attacking the church. And then the people in the church, even though what they stood for was right, they got offended. I was there. We were there. They got offended. And when they got offended, see, the devil just wants your attention. He don't care how he gets it. People don't understand that. He don't care how he gets it. That's why people get caught up with different sins. And they're glad that they don't have so-and-so sin. I'm glad I don't have to deal with what Mike deals with. Well, he don't have to deal with what I deal with. I need to focus on what I need to deal with, right? And the way the enemy might work in my life. But over a period of time, a few years there, the church became offended is the best way to say it. And the only thing I'd say about that he was, was, was he didn't, he did not, I don't want to say he fostered it or tried to make it that way or feed it or whatever, but he didn't direct it, I guess you could say. And I learned that from him. I learned not to do that. I learned how to make sure, no, we're not going to talk about it. You, you'll see me sometimes, people saying all these different things, and it's not right now, but people saying all sorts of things, I just ignore them and keep on going. Give no weight to it. Doesn't make any difference whatsoever. We just speak the truth. Right? Love works no ill. Let them say, let them do, let them do it. I don't need to defend myself. God's my defender. Amen. Matter of fact, if you defend yourself, you get in God's way. You hinder his justice system from operating properly. Amen. If you defend yourself. People say this to me, and it just blows my mind. They say, well, if I don't stand up for myself, who will? God. Amen. Didn't mean to shock you and knock you off your seat or anything. <laughs> Because I'm talking to Christians, but that's just mind-blowing to me when people say that kind of stuff. Well, if I don't make it right, who will? I guess the judge, God, he, he, he can, he's able if you'll cooperate with him, right? But over a period of time, the church got offended at what these people were doing, and the focus was no longer on the vision, and now it was on what was being said and done towards us. And I told you this past week what happened. We lost over a period of time, we lost over 100 people. And that's not exaggerating. It was 50 in a real short period of time, and then gradually, many more after that. And it got turned around and went back when we was, took over, and all that good stuff was great. But the reality of it was, that, who was wrong in that situation? This is how it works with you. Both of you can be wrong. Somebody may do something wrong to you or say things to hurt you or mistreat you or even abuse you, but what you do with what's been done to you is up to you. And if you don't obey the Lord and walk in the love of God, you hinder the blessings of God. People say, but my husband, but my wife, but my friend, but so-and-so at work. No, God says, but you. You're not held accountable for them. You have accountable for you. I'm going to try to compress this. But I was working in Blumenthal down the road there when it was Blumenthal. <clears throat> Several, several years ago, that's where we ever moved. Uh, Daddy taught us to work, be faithful, do what we're called to do. You know, do what we need to do, shut up and do your job was the way we was raised. People think that's hard today, but I know a lot of people that need that message. And that's what he taught us. He didn't tell us to shut up, but we got the point. We knew when our brakes were. That's when you got done. That's just the way we worked. That's the way we were taught. Every Saturday, every evening, whatever it was after school. But I was working at Blumenthal, been working hard, doing what Daddy, you know, taught me to do. And, and got promoted, I'll just compress it, got promoted from material handler, which was the lowest job in my department, to supervisor, which other than the superintendent, was the highest job in my department. The second in command, I guess you could say. And I got the first shift. That's another whole story where I believe God, and he made them possible, possible. Do you know all things are possible now to believe it? Yes. Well, in the process of me being promoted, I became uh, the foreman which is right below a supervisor or salary position. And I was still on the first shift there at that time. And, and I, I had a boss man. And my boss man, who was a superintendent, him and his buddies, there was four supervisors, and I was one of four, him and his buddies would go out here to Thursdays and they would hire the winder tenders 
the ladies that worked on these winders, and they would go up here and flirt and play with these young girls and stuff and give them a job to come back here and work back here on the winders. And when they first started, they never came to my shift. It's while they were, I don't know how to say it, how, while they were still fellowshipping with them, they would put them on the shift of the fellow that was tied with the superintendent. That's where, you know, you keep them over here until you get tired of them. Keep them over here and take care of them. And I was raised to do your job, so if you didn't run 90, 91% efficiency on my shift, no matter who you were, you were going to find another job because we weren't going to fail. It don't matter how you look or smell or nothing else, you're not running 65% efficiency on my shift. You go into somebody else's shift or another job somewhere. So what my boss would do was he would use these, I don't know a better way to say it, he said, well, he might hear this. He might, but he's dead, so I don't know where he's at. He died. I mean, it don't always work out for the little person. Just stay the course. And I'm not saying it was because of that, but I'm just saying if you choose a, a path of life, regardless, you reap what you sow if you don't repent. It can get worse or better from where you are tonight, is my point. But but I, I, I was I would be I was on first shift, or I was A shift, A shift, A, B, C, and D. And they, they, they kept doing this with this cycle. And he would take these girls, these young girls, and put them on my shift. And you know, on first shift, you know the kind of women you usually got is the one that's been there the longest. And I'm not saying all of them like this, but you got the older ladies that's been around for a while. And Lord, if they're not saved, they're grumpy. They ain't happy at all. I mean, they just growl at you when you get in the morning time. Other just one or two of them. I mean, they wouldn't. And whatever they thought, that's what they said, you know. And then he, my boss would bring these girls to my shift and put on my shift and they wouldn't do their job and I could chew them up one side and down the other and I wouldn't. And I wouldn't hear as much a Christian I am not. But I'd chew them out when they didn't do their job. And I'd get on them real good. I would even sit down to write the group one morning for failure to follow instructions or not run efficiency and I'd take it to my boss man and he'd turn blood red all over. He was embarrassed and he tried to figure out what he's going to do because they can't get fired. Because if they get fired, they, they, might, they might squeal. You know what I mean? They might tell them, you know, they was doing more than, never mind, never mind. I don't know how they got the job, it's just an assumption, either way. But they, they had this process. Well, they would bring them to my shift and let them stay there and, and I could chew them out or do whatever, correct them, I guess is the right word, word and I, but he would not let me write them up. He would not let me do anything that would cause him any consequences, at least for a period of time, so he could get some breathing room from, you know, maybe they got this out of their mind, the way it went. Well, over a period of time, I don't know how to say it nicely, I hated his guts. I hated him. God knows I wanted to choke him every single day. Because he was putting me in a situation where he was the one doing these things, but it looked like it would be me because I'm the one that's not firing him. And everybody on my shift, especially these old ladies, they knew if you didn't do your job, you wouldn't have one no more. They knew that. And now these girls come on my shift and they just stay there and about do what they want to do. Oh, I was living every day. And I'd go in. There's no nice talk. I mean, I got offended. I got to talking. And I'd tell other people the best thing that happened to me is get fired. And I kept on and on and on. Grunting. The more I talked about it, you know, the more you talk about your offense, the worse it gets. The more bitter you get. The more resentful you get. You get worse and worse and worse. You, we'll look at it in a minute. People are trouble. But you're doing nothing but poisoning yourself. That's all you're doing. You're poisoning yourself and everybody around you. The Lord spoke to me one day. I was believing God every day on the way to work. I was believing God, Mark 11, 22, 3, and 4. You know, one of the signs of being offended is you won't get your prayers answered. It don't matter how much you pray. You say, I can pray. I can seek God for myself. You can, but God won't answer your prayers if you're not in love. Every day I pray, Lord, leave me and Lord, always believe in God. I'm getting a promotion to that first. I was a foreman, which was still hourly, and, and I wanted to, I wanted the next one, which was a, a, a legitimate supervisor with a $15,000, $20,000 a year raise, and it had been much better. And, and, but, but I was believing God for these things, and we were praying and praying like a machine gun, and at the same time, I was hoping every day this jerk was getting fired because of the way he did it. That was my way out, was, was he needs to get fired so somebody else can use me. And the Lord spoke to me one day. He said, as long as you have those things in your heart towards your boss, you're never going to receive a promotion. He said, I'm not going to bless you. And that, that was way back yonder, but I learned the lesson. It doesn't matter what the other person does. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters what you do. I changed my heart that day. It's the hardest thing I ever did. It took a lot of faith. 
But the Lord said, I want you to pray and believe that he'll be blessed and he'll be promoted and his next step would have been a vice president and that he'll get promoted and get a company car. Now the first week or two, that was really hard to pray that. You said, did he get promoted? No, he got fired. That, that wasn't God's point. That wasn't his point. He was working on my heart. And I began to pray for God to promote this man. You know what happened? He's the one God used to promote me to a supervisor. And me and him, even though we didn't agree with everything, we were like that and would talk for hours at a time. Even about the Lord before I left there in, in 2000. God used that very same person that I wish much evil against. Why did I wish that against him? Was he right in what he did? Was he right in the way he was treating me? No, and that was just the worst thing. He did many things. He told us to go do stuff, and I'm the supervisor, and I told him, I was taught to obey my authority. And then the president would come back there and say, Oh, who told you to do this, that, and the other? And then my boss would get mad if I told him he's the one told me. He'd tell us to do stuff, and then he'd say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Lie like a dog. It's hard to deal with people lying. But God used that man to promote me when? When I got my heart right. He was wrong in everything he said and did. See, you can be so sure the other person's wrong that you missed out that you are too. Does that make any sense whatsoever? You can be so sure the other person's wrong that you missed out that you are too. You're responsible for the state of your heart. Amen? <clears throat> this is all to help you, not to hurt you. Offense is coming to every one of you. Offense, don't take the bait as the title of this message. Again, the Lord said to me, many have been living offended for some time. Many have become offended, but their offense is not yet deep-rooted. Yet others are on the brink of offense right now. You might be in a situation where you have just been recently done wrong. Many people, their lives are defined by things that were done to them 20 and 25 and 30 years ago. They never deal with the hurt. And it defines their the rest of their life. You see people are not thinking or knocking and not thinking about anybody, but you see people in relationships. You see the women will think every man is like that man that did them wrong back yonder. And the men that think every woman is just like that one back there. You're letting what somebody did to you 20, 30 years ago control you today. You're letting what happened back yonder destroy maybe even a God-ordained relationship. I've had people who come in and Lord didn't know about it because we heard all the stories and they'd tell you why they had a hard time trusting pastors. I've never done a thing to them. They had a hard time trusting me because they hadn't dealt with hurt and pain that was caused by a pastor way back yonder. You have to deal with these things. Let me show you how, right? According to the Bible, offense comes to us all. So in reality, in some measure, this message is for who? Everybody. You need to ask yourself. It doesn't matter if it's in the church. It doesn't have to have anything to do with me. It could be your personal life with people I know nothing about. We're talking about the state of your heart. You must ask yourself, how does this message apply to me? And am I offended? Am I offended? Matthew 24, we know what this says. I read it even Sunday morning. Again, the Lord told me to take my time, so I'm trying to. It's just not easy. And this talks about the signs of the times, the last days that are come to come. All of these things are going to increase. I say this regularly and it really bothers me because it does hinder people from receiving. We are in, we, there seems to be, especially in the church, more so than ever before, there's an epidemic of offense. It seems to be everybody's offended about something. But when we get a revelation that offense and to be offended is sin... We may realize why things are not working out in our heart and life like they should. The Lord told me about my boss man. He told me. Not only did a guy lose his job shortly down the road, well, just a few years ago, he, he died. I mean, of a physical ailment. You said, is that because of anything he did to you? I would absolutely would never say that. I'm just saying, the course of his life had nothing to do with me, but the course of my life had to do with the way I treated him. I can promise you that. The way I responded to him. Right? He said in Matthew 24, verse 10, it says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. That's the process. That's the process that takes place of office. Shall many be offended and shall betray one another and hate one another. Amplified says, <coughs> many will be offended and repelled and will begin to distrust and desert him whom they ought to trust and obey. 
and will stumble and fall away and betray one another and pursue one another with hatred. Offense is a separator. Offense is a divider from two major groups of people. Number one, you begin to distrust and desert those whom you trust and obey. Just like we read last week in Mark 6, 1 through 6. You remember they were offended at Jesus and it's not this the carpenter, Mary's son. In other words, they're saying, who does he think he is? Jesus was not in sin. Jesus was not wrong and had done nothing wrong. But he did not, his power was not limited. Did they receive from him the fullness of the power available? No. Why? Because offense separates you from the power and the flow of the Spirit and the blessings of God. That's why you can get offended and come into church and be confused when other people say, Oh my God, that message changed my life and you got nothing. Because you're offended. And it doesn't have to be offended at me. You do need a revelation that the enemy wants you offended at the people primarily that God placed in your life. Don't lose that. He does. Right? Why do you think he endeavored to work in your house that way? He endeavors to work in the church that way. Verse 12, 11 says, In the King James, many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because, verse 12, iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. <coughs> Amplified 24, 10 of Matthew, the love of the great body of people will grow cold because of the multiplied lawlessness and iniquity. And we told you this past week, Sunday morning, when it says the love, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. That word is agape. That's the love of God. So he's talking about the body of Christ. He has to be. That's agape love. Nobody has agape love that God kind of love but born again believers. The world doesn't have the love of God in them until they receive Jesus. We're not there yet. We'll get there tonight probably. But that's the cure for offense is walking in the love of God. It's impossible to be in love and be offended. And it's impossible to receive anything by faith from God and in God when you're out of love. It stop, offense stops your life dead in the strikes, spiritually speaking. Luke 17, 1, we'll read 3 and 4, 1, 2, 3 and 4 later, but just one amplified. Jesus said to his disciples... Temptations is amplified. Snares, traps set to entice to sin are sure to come. But woe to him through who they come. Talking about offense, it says in the King James. But disciples, his disciples, temptations, snares, traps set to entice to sin are sure to come. You're going to feel offended, it comes to us all, but it's how you deal with it that matters. I haven't read this book in years, but John Bevere has a book titled The Bait of Satan. But I do have this. It's about offense. I got this little thing that I printed out, keep it in my Bible, and it's about that. John Bevere said this. The word offense in the Greek is scandalon, which is the trigger of a hunter's trap that holds the bait. When we take the bait of offense, we trigger the enemy's trap and we become captive. Knowingly or unknowingly, when we're hurt, we build walls up to protect ourselves from pain. But these walls also end up hurting us. They become mental and emotional strongholds that separate you from God and others. Unforgiveness harms you more than it does the person that hurt you. Unforgiveness harms you more than it does the person who hurt you. Forgiveness does not mean approval. It's a conscious decision to forgive the person who wronged you. And this is Colossians 3.13. Make allowance for each other's faults. Forgive anybody who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you so you must forgive others. Amen. And we got our picture of the trap, I believe. That, that was the title I got the picture before we actually even did the, <coughs> the message or started it. But you got the trap there in the bottom. And, and they take the trap, as I told you, they tie it off to a tree or something. And, and then they would camouflage it and cover it up real good. See, the devil will make you think you're right. If you listen to him, you say, well, I am right. You, you're wrong regardless if you're offended. 
Offense of sin. So you got the, and he baits the trap there where the fellow's standing and, and really be the whole, the whole uh, contraption of the trap, but the reality of it is, by definition, is the bait stick, which is the part of the trap that you put the bait on. And, and then, and, and, and what would the bait be? Very often, it comes through James 3, 2 there. It comes through words that are said. Different things. You can take a message. When I'm ministering a message, I can be 100% in line with the spirit of the word. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm just using that as an example. But I do take it seriously. I'll be 100% in line with the spirit of the word. And you can sit there in the flesh and say, I know he's saying that for me. I, I know he means that for me. I know he knows what's going on in my life and that's why he's saying that. And you can become offended. And that will hinder you from receiving what the Spirit of God said because you brought what's in the Spirit down to the flesh, down in the natural. Some in the church can make a comment or something to you. You're not sure if they mean anything bad or not. But the more you leave here and you go to thinking about it, you begin to say, well, well, you, well what? I wonder what they meant by that. And then you go sit down at supper tonight or tomorrow, whatever. And you're with your buddies and your friends and your pals or whoever you got with you. And you say, well, you just don't believe what so-and-so said to me. You already took the bait. You've already become offended even though you're in the beginning of the process. You're offended at what's been said and done. We have a society and even a church that takes pride in being offended. We have people now that are gathering together over 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 1. You went down to 3 or 4 there. And it says in the last days... <coughs> That they will heap together themselves, teachers having itching ears. Most people today gather with people, even the church, this is most like them. Not the most like Jesus. This is most like them. You'll find people that believe on calling everybody out and railing on everybody. You'll see them attracted to those preachers. That's where they gravitate. You'll find people that do, that do get a hold of this false grace message. They'll find people that say what they want them to say. And that's who they go to. You won't ever change and grow that way. You need to be where God's called you. Right? You don't need what you want. You need what you need. And only God knows what you need. But people gravitate there. They say, well, why don't I go to this denomination or the other? Well, what if God wants you over here? That's not even a consideration. Very many times, even our gatherings, and I'm not saying it's that way here, I pray it's not, and we work on it not being, but many times even churches, the gathering of the offended. We're right, and so and so's wrong, or vice versa. To offend, we know, is to cause a person or group to feel hurt, angry, or upset by something said or done. So the bait that Satan uses to bait the trap is your feelings. There's no coincidence, as I said before, there's no coincidence that we are in an age now that the only thing that matters even in the church is how it makes me feel. That's not what it's about. Right? you got to do something with your feelings. Your feelings will betray you. You can feel one way this minute, one way the next, but the Word's always the same. And the Spirit will lead you in line with the Word. Right? Offense in the Greek is, as we said, a trap stick, a snare, a stumbling block is the movable stick or trigger of a trap. And we looked at all those things, but we've seen plainly that the, the bait Satan uses is anything said or done to produce hurt feelings or cause you to become upset. His purpose is for you to take the bait, catches you in his trap, and then you'll not move forward in your life and your walk with God because of what's been said or done. And as we've mentioned repeatedly, and I'm going to continue to say, offense is coming to It's coming to everybody. There are no exceptions. You will be mistreated. You will be talked about. You might even be looked down on. People might even see you as less than. The feelings that arise at this time in and of themselves are not sin. Anger is not sin. Jesus got angry over in Mark chapter 2, but he did not sin. Right? And he tells us over in Ephesians chapter 4, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So you can have feelings of anger and not act on them. Choose love and not sin. It's what you do with the feelings. The feelings in and of themselves are not wrong. 
But you'll see people sometimes that are so guarded about their feelings. You're not telling me nothing. I know how I feel. It won't take you anywhere. It'll keep you where you are. We need to get, get off of what everybody said and done to us and, and get focused on what God's done for us and through Christ Jesus. We have the victory. And I don't think people realize you'll find another thing about people that get offended. They're very controlled. But they have no control. It's very odd. Because they're offended and they're always endeavoring to control everything, to control the narrative. And the reality of it is the entirety of their life is being controlled by what somebody did to them months, sometimes years ago. They're not in control. If you're making decisions today based on what's been done to you, you're not in control. And neither is God. The enemy, through offense, somebody did this, that, or the other, is absolutely controlling your life. I refuse to let anybody control me but the Spirit of God. We're going to do what God says to He said, I've been legitimately hurt, been legitimately mistreated. Nobody said everything was all right. Forgiveness is not approval. Forgiveness on your part means to cancel the debt. But God is still the judge. And if a man or woman does not repent, they read what they said. Amen? Look at, uh, what was it, First Samuel? You remember a fellow named David? You remember little old David out in the field, right? The whole army of Israel, all of them, you know, facing the Philistines and, and Goliath. And you got little David. He, he's not even good enough to be out there in the army. So he, he's running the air. And he hears about the threatenings and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and he, he wants a chance and says, I can do this and I can do that. Long story short, we know David rose up with a sling and a stone and slew Goliath. Shortly thereafter, you know, everybody should be celebrating because he's the representative, I guess, of the, yeah, of the, of the children of Israel and the Philistines. Goliath was the representative. So between Goliath and David, whoever won in reality, that whole side won. So you'd think when David slew Goliath that everybody would be happy. But were they happy? Now there was, was a fellow named Saul. And what did the women, they was partying and all this kind of stuff in the street when Goliath was slow, slain. And what happened? They said, Saul had slain his thousands and, and David his ten thousands. And from that moment, David didn't do anything wrong. But from that moment, Saul set his eyes upon, his heart upon David to kill him. And he went on and on and on again. I mean, he, it wasn't all secreted. Some of it was secreted, put him in the heat of the battle. But sometimes he took the spear and tried to kill him. All David did was flee out of his presence. And if you follow that story, it's changed my life. If you follow that story all the way through, David never changed who he was. He didn't say what Saul did was all right. We get down to the end of the story here in 1 Samuel 24. <coughs> David has run up on Saul, the king in the cave, who steady been trying to kill him. David went in the cave while he was sleeping to Saul and cut off part of his robe. And then he felt convicted in his spirit. He felt convicted by God because he shouldn't have done that. Now what would you have thought? Kill him dead while he's in there sleeping. Yeah, that's what you'd have felt even if you had done it. He's been trying to kill me and now even the people around him. Be careful who your friends are. Even the people around him, what they say? Oh, God has delivered him into your hands. Kill him. That's what his friend said. You need some faith friends, not some fake friends, right? <clears throat> but he said, I should not touch God's anointing. Go on down to verse 9. David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt. Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord hath delivered thee this day into my hand. In the cave, and some bade me, they, they encouraged him to kill him. But my eye spared thee and said, I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. Moreover, my father, see ye, yeah, see the skirt of the robe in my hand. He cut a piece off just to show that he was there and could have killed him. Friend, that I cut off the skirt of thy robe and killed thee not. Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in my hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. He had been done wrong. He had an opportunity to kill Saul, but he did not take it. He kept his heart right. Did it mean that Saul wasn't in trouble? If you read the rest of the story, you know what happened to Saul. Not only was him and his sons killed, I guess he fell on a sword and killed himself, but he's going to be killed anyways. But the reality of it is, then they took their bodies, him and his sons, and made a spectacle out of them. 
So Saul's end wasn't that good, but David said in verse, what is that? I got it so marked up again. Read 12. The Lord judge between me and thee. And the Lord avenge me. God's a judge. You might have been done wrong. Let God deal with it. Don't take offense. Give it to God. Trust God to make the wrongs right in your life. That's what we're supposed to do. The Lord avenge me of thee. But this is what David said. And mine hand shall not be upon thee. Now, I don't have time to go over it, but you can look at God's Word, Translation, NLT, and the Good News Bible, they also. But he said in 13, As saith the Proverbs of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked. He's telling Saul, you're doing what you're doing because your heart's wrong, and there's evil in you. But he said, my hand shall not be upon you. He's honoring God and doing what's right. Don't allow the people to dictate. Don't allow offense to dictate the direction of your life. 15, the Lord judge, be, therefore be judged and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of my hand. Who's the judge? God is the judge. You're going to depend on him to be the judge. Look at Hebrews 12. We mentioned it, but we never looked at this last week. Hebrews 12, 14. <coughs> I want you to understand that offense not dealt with will completely destroy your life. This message has changed my life forever. There's a freedom. You say you're not tempted to be offended. Yeah, we're not going to get there tonight. One of the first things you've got to do in order to overcome offense is you've got to recognize it when it comes. You've got to recognize that the devil's baiting the trap and waiting for you to take it. That's why a lot of times there's things you can say or do, and it might even be true, but you just grin and keep your mouth closed. Because when you give voice to it, you won't believe what they did. You won't believe what they said. And if you say, well, you just don't know the truth, you don't either. Almost everything people know comes from somebody else. And it's either a liar or distorted. Most of everything you hear is not true. You can't hardly believe nothing that you hear and probably not half of what you see. It's all distorted. That's why you got to listen to the Word. You ever had people to say things about other people? You felt dumb afterwards or bad afterwards, I guess you could say, because you got around those people and you realized they wasn't the problem. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. 12, excuse me, 14 and 15 in the New Living Translation says, Work at living in peace with everyone. And work at living a holy life. For those who are not holy will not see the Lord. 15. NOT. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God. This is what it says. Watch out that no poisonous root of bitterness, offense, grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Offense poisons you. It'll cause you to be resentful. It'll cause you to be bitter. It'll cause you to be toxic. Offense grows inside of you if you feed it by meditating on it and thinking about it and talking about it. Offense does not just corrupt you. It will affect every relationship in your life. If you allow it to. One of the examples that, that I have read and studied, I hadn't been to Africa, I hadn't been to Australia, I hadn't been to none of these places. So I hadn't hunted monkeys myself. I'm going to tell you tonight, don't be a monkey. And I'll tell you my story, you'll understand, it'll stick with you. Another minister that I have read behind and studied along these lines a lot, he said, over here, I think he said Africa or Australia, I just started with A, but I don't know which country. But he said, they got these fellas, that, oh, they don't do it around here in, in the United States, I don't believe. They probably put you in jail. But they hunt monkeys over there. And they said, this is the way that they hunt the monkeys. Monkeys like coconuts. So they take a coconut, the hunters will, 
they take a coconut and they drill a hole in it. And monkeys don't just like coconuts to eat. Monkeys are very curious. And they like flashy stuff. Some of y'all's monkeys. You're real curious. And if it flashes, y'all run to it. You don't need to do that. But the, the, hunt, the monkey hunters take the coconut. The story will stick with you the rest of your life. You listen. Some of you might already know it. <clears throat> but the, the, the hunters will take this coconut and they drill a hole down inside of it. You know, the coconut's hard on the outside, but it's soft on the inside. And, and, and they drill a hole in it and they take a flashy object and push it way down in there. And then they tie the coconut off where the monkey can't just grab it and run off just like you do one of these traps up here at your silver screen. So the monkey comes along and, and it sees this coconut laying there all luscious and juicy. And not only that, it gets to looking and they got this hole in there and it's something flashy in there. So he takes his arm and his hand and sticks it down in there and grabs hold of this little piece of tin or aluminum that they put in there that's flashy. And he wants it so bad, he refuses to let it go. As long as his hand's in there and his fist is balled up, the hole's drilled to the size where he can't get his arm out. So he's sitting there, will not let go of what he's holding on to that is absolutely worthless, by the way. It's nothing but bait and decoy. You understand that? It's absolutely worthless what he's holding on to. But he cannot get free because he won't let it go. And the coconut's tied off, so he cannot take the coconut anywhere and just run down in the woods. So literally the hunters come back while the monkey, who if he would just let go, could get free and run off, the monkey loses his life because he will not let go of something that is absolutely worthless. And that's what you're doing if you're over on offense. It's worthless. It has no value. None. The only value it has is on the enemy's side to destroy you. We've done this with our children for years. We, we love them dearly. I don't cater to We don't cater to their feelings. You say, oh, you just don't know. People say today, that's all it's about is how everybody makes you feel. You're in trouble. Big trouble. Because the reality what you just told me is everybody else, what they say and do, controls your life. You're not in control. It's great today when they like you and are saying positive things about you and the children. We've taught the children. Are we perfect parents? No, but teaching the word, you're accepted by God. It doesn't matter if people love you today and hate you tomorrow. God loves you yesterday. He loves you today and he'll love you tomorrow. Right. There's a steadfastness when your faith is in God. It doesn't matter. He says so-and-so be left out. It don't matter. When you get an adult, people will leave you out. <laughs> they'll leave you out. Amen. They mess around with me and leave me out. Think they hurt my feelings. I'm having on another day. <laughs> I'm usually the oddball. He said, you did not, we didn't mean that by to invite you. He said, it's all right, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> I'm not offended. Amen. Acts 14. I'm going to close, i got plenty more. <clears throat> Don't be like the monkey. Don't hold on to what's absolutely worthless when all you've got to do is let it go and you can run off into freedom and victory. Acts 14. Starting in verse 1 says, And it came to pass in Iconium that they both, that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake that a great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. But it says in verse 2, the unbelieving Jews did what? They stirred up the Gentiles, they made their minds evil affected against the believers. The unbelieving Jews, unbelieving means to disbelieve, to be uncompliant. You'll find when people get offended, they're not compliant with anything unless you agree with their offense. That's the only thing they want to talk about. Then it's not in every case because God will give you godly relationships and divine appointments and all such things. But sometimes people like to get around other people and you want to ask them, what you so tight with so and so for? The only way you can be tight with is if you agree with them, you're offended too. Birds of a feather flock together. When people get offended and bitter, that's the only kind of people they want to run. So if you're going to walk with God, you have to keep your company. Be careful who you keep company with. Stirred up. Stirred up means, and I don't have time for you to write this down, but it means to raise or excite against. So 
So this one group that was offended at the message, the unbelieving Jews, they didn't just go back home and leave it alone. They stirred up, they excited or instigated against the Gentiles and they made their minds evil affected against the brother. What was their goal? That, that means in the Greek, evil affected means to make angry or to embitter. So they didn't just not agree with the message. They made it their goal to stir up the others so they couldn't believe or wouldn't believe. So when the word came, they rejected it instead of received it. They became offended at the word. Then they began to share this offense with the Gentiles to make them bitter and angry just like they were. And if you went down to see what happens, because I've told you offense will separate you. Offense will divide you. We saw that in John 6 and Mark 6 last week or Sunday morning. <clears throat> it says what, this was the results in verse 4. The multitude of the city was what? Divided. Divided. And in part held with the Jews and part with the, the apostles. apostles. Offense will always divide. NLT says, but the people of the town were divided in their opinion about them. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. Offended people are dividers because they always make people, as I said earlier, choose sides. Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. There's a freedom in you deciding to walk in the love of God and doing this. It doesn't matter what they say to me or about me. It doesn't matter if they get a group together. It doesn't matter if they write a book. It doesn't matter what they do. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to walk by faith. We're going to walk in love. And we choose to forgive. Now, a lot of people say, well, you have to forgive so-and-so because you don't have anything to do with them. You have no idea what you're talking about. Luke 17, 1 through 4, read when you get home. Just because you forgive somebody does not mean the relationship is restored. It's not the same thing. The Bible says if your brother, your sister, your cousin, your aunt, your mama, your daddy, whoever it is, if they sin against you and they repent, then restoration can take place. But see, I forgive regardless. No matter what they do, I can choose to be unoffendable. I don't think that's a word, but I use it. I know when I type it in, it says it's not a word, but I still use it. I choose to not be offended. You say, is it easy? It's not easy, but at the same time, I'll tell you this, it's freedom. True freedom. People, everybody wants it, but even many Christians don't have it. True freedom is walking in the love of God. And we will definitely look at that before we get done with this. But true freedom is walking in God's love. Because you're not controlled by what other people say and do. You're not controlled by what happens to you. Your faith and trust is in God. You wake up every day and you see God and you simply say, Lord, what would you have to say to me today? What would you have me to do? You just do that and regardless of what people do, you just keep on going. And you know what will happen to you? You'll accomplish the perfect will, plan, and purpose of God for your life. Something else that will happen is even right now, you may not realize it, but people are watching you. And they'll see your witness. You chose right even when others chose wrong. And God will promote you. And God will bless you. You'll have joy. You'll have peace. All in the storm. Amen? This is a good uh, introduction for Pastor Appreciation Sunday. So don't be offended. Stand your feet. <coughs> But I, as I said, I won't be ministering on, on Sunday morning. But the last part of this message about the steps and decisions you need to make to overcome offense daily, to live free of offense, are extremely important. And somehow or another, I think it'll go with next week's message. We'll figure it out as we listen to the Spirit of God. But uh, that's what he's dealing with me about before church tonight. So we're just going to obey him, and we're going to go with him and flow with him. We're going to walk in God's best. Amen? Every, bed, every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We love you and thank you so much for this day. You many blessings your hand upon me, your spirit, leading and guiding you. us, not just me. So the hand upon us, your spirit, leading and guiding us. Thank you for all that's been said and done this night. Father, I know that sometimes we joke this way or that way, and it doesn't hurt people to, to laugh. Laughter's good as like a medicine, and, and that's great. But the, Father, I've in no way, shape, form, or fashion intended for this to be a joking matter. 
because it is not a joke. It will cause you to be bitter and resentful if you get offended, and it will still all quality of life. And Father, we choose you, and we choose love. And we know there may be people that intentionally do things towards us. But many people say and do things and don't even realize what they've done. And if we're ever ready to believe the best every person, that, that'll be our mindset. Well, they probably didn't even mean that. They probably didn't even mean it that way. And either way, we'll just forgive them and keep on going. Every head bowed and every eye closed here tonight. You say, Pastor, I don't know this Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. I don't know if I was to die tonight. I go to heaven. You can have what we call no soul salvation. It's faith in Christ and His finished work. The Bible says, God said in the Word, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised from the dead, you'll be saved. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're here tonight and you say, Pastor, I do not know I'm a Christian. I do not know I'm a child of God. God's not my Father. Jesus is not my Lord and Savior. I've never made Him so. Never received Him. And you need to pray with you to make Jesus Lord of your life tonight. Without hesitation, slip your hand up boldly. Anybody in the place? Number two, you sign I'm a Christian. I have no doubt, but I got out of fellowship. Well, we thank God. We know the moment we sin, Jesus, our advocate, begins to work on our hearts. The Holy Spirit begins to deal with our spirit to bring us right back into fellowship with the Father. But we got to cooperate. He said if we confess that we've sinned, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins and all unrighteousness. In other words, you'd say, Father, I've missed it. I've sinned. Come short of the glory. I ask you to forgive me and cleanse me. What would He do? Would He forgive you, church? Yes. You hear tonight and you say, I want you to pray with me, Pastor. To rededicate my heart and life to God. So if you hand up, I'll lead anybody in the place. God is with us. You look up now, you got any special need of prayer request. You can come down now, we'll be glad to pray with you. Anybody. I pray that you're getting something out of this message. I know it's the word number one. I know it's changed my life number two. And if you'll apply, it'll change your life as well. Amen. We choose to walk in love and not be offended. God is with us. Amen. We love you. We appreciate you. You guys are dismissed. Yeah. <laughs>